session. According to my watch, it is 15 minutes past the top of the hour, so let us begin. First of all, my name is Paige Valderrama Graff, and I am coming to you from the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, we are part of the Astromaterials Research and Exploration Science, or ARIES division, right here on site at the NASA Johnson Space Center. Here with me is Rosina Miller and Emily Maudlin. They are helping to facilitate some of the questions that you might have, as well as monitoring the chat window for any issues that you might need help getting resolved. So Rosina and Emily are also here at the Johnson Space Center with me. But what we really are very excited to do with all of you is to share this NASA NEMO 22 webinar in which we plan to have a live connection with NEMO 22 crew member and planetary scientist Trevor Graff from the world's only undersea laboratory. This is a really special opportunity. We're gonna teach you a little bit about the NASA NEMO mission and of course highlight Trevor who is part of this expedition. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we have quite a few groups participating from all across the nation, some of which will participate in the archive, some of you who are with us here live today, and we're so glad that we, you have taken time out of your busy summer and your busy day to join us, because we really have uh, quite a few people from all across the United States. So all 600 of you out there or so, Thank you again for joining us today. We are really looking forward to sharing this live connection with you. Now, before we bring Trevor into this mix, I wanted to be able to provide you with a little bit of an overview of NASA NEMO and NEMO 22. Now, Trevor Graff is one of four crew members. So what you can see on the screen here, the, the other crew members, we have Shell Lindgren, who is a US astronaut. He is also the NEMO 22 commander. Joining him in the Aquarius habitat is Pedro Duque. He is a European Space Agency astronaut. Also down there is Dom D'Agostino. Now Dom is a University of South Florida associate professor and an IHM, IHMC or Institute for Human and Machine Cognition research scientist. And then on the right is Trevor Graff. Now I wanted to show this picture because these are the crew members in sort of their everyday attire, so to speak. When they fly in space, they're wearing their spacesuits. When they're in the laboratory, they might be using laboratory equipment, or if they're out in the field, they might be dressed in field clothes. But these crew members have changed this attire to be able to put on their scuba gear and be part of the NEMO 22 expedition. So you can see here, these are the crew members in their underwater environment. They do get an orientation of the environment, so they uh, use scuba gear to be able to, to get familiar with what they're doing. Also, you'll notice in the top left-hand corner image, we have the four crew members, but also in the window, we have uh, the Aquarius Habtex. Now, these Habtex are so essential for the smooth running of these NEMO expeditions there in the Aquarius laboratory. So the lab techs are every bit as part of this crew as the crew members down there in Aquarius, as well as the top side support teams that help make these expeditions successful. Now, you might be thinking, well, what is NEMO? Well, NEMO is an acronym and it stands for NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. What is NEMO all about? We know now that it takes place in this Aquarius habitat, but what is it really all about? Well, here's sort of the what. NEMO has been a series of 22 space exploration simulations that have been conducted since 2001. And what they are, are NASA analog missions that really work or integrate scientists, engineers, astronauts, to all work together and live in a challenging underwater environment. Now, when we say an analog mission, these are missions that help prepare NASA for future surface exploration in, uh, on other planetary worlds. And those are their own challenging environments themselves. But you can see here, crew members, when they're out on an EVA or extravehicular activity, 
they have to be hatted so that they can breathe and uh, be able to walk around for three to four hours during an EVA. They also have to be, in a sense, tethered, so, and they have these umbilical cords, as they refer to them, that enable them to get the air that they need to be able to breathe. They're also working with underwater equipment that has to be in specialized housing so that they can see commands, see input being sent down from above the surface so that they can do the work that they need to do. But then inside the habitat itself, Again, we have our four crew members and the, um, the lab techs that are in there. They all make up part of the expedition, at least from the bottom side. So where are they and where is this taking place? Well, the Aquarius Reef Base is the world's only undersea research station. And it is located off of Key Largo, about five miles off of Key Largo in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Now this Aquarius reef based laboratory is 62 feet below the surface of the ocean. So they are literally underwater at depth at 62 feet. Uh, and this particular uh, habitat is operated by Florida International University. So they do an excellent job to be able to help facilitate these missions and keep the crew members safe and able to do the tasks that they're asked to do. Now we're gonna get a view of the interior of the habitat momentarily once we connect with Trevor. But one thing I wanna point out is in the lower right hand corner, we have this yellow LSB. LSB stands for life support buoy. All communications and things that the crew needs in terms of air and how they can communicate with the top side all occurs through that buoy and this, um, hand-sized sort of cable where everything gets, in a sense, piped down. So it's quite a fascinating uh, type of environment where we can connect with these folks down there and the life support buoy is an important part of that aspect. Now, why do we run these NASA missions and why do we run them in the Aquarius habitat? Well, first of all, the Aquarius habitat and its surroundings provide a very convincing analog for, for space exploration in this undersea world. I mean, this is an, a hostile type of world. It's, a, in a sense, a place where you just can't walk around like you would on the surface of the Earth. So this environment, this enclosed environment, helps model or simulate what crew members might experience if they were exploring another world. Think about the International Space Station, for instance. They have a relatively small amount of space to live and work and do the, the types of activities that are required of them up in space. Now we're below the ocean surface where again, the crew members are in a confined space where they have to do a variety of activities. And these NEMO missions combine science, operations, and equipment all into sort of um, one holistic mission or expedition. So any expedition that is run through NASA or any space agency, there's always an integration of science activities, operational activities, and testing tools that could be used when we're thinking about the future of exploration. Now, who is involved with NEMO? Well, certainly NASA and other space agencies are involved with NEMO missions. And here you can just see a couple of past pictures as well as our crew members in the middle. And you can see the smattering of different universities and organizations and space agencies that have all played a role through the years of these NEMO missions to help further what we know and help make future exploration uh, a better and closer possibility uh, to things that we can actually run. So these missions and those that participate again are extremely important. These 20 to 30 crew members and people that you can see topside on these boats, these are people that bring together expertise in a variety of ways, engineering, science, all sorts of backgrounds so that they can work together to have these NEMO missions be successful. Now we talked about science, operations, and tools. Well, thinking about science, 
our NASA Astro Materials team is the lead of the NEMO science team. And this slide just kind of gives you an indication of some of the science roles that these people play as part of NEMO and also gives you a view of these individuals that are a part of these missions as well. So we have our science team lead, Kelsey Young. And as you can tell here, she is not in an underwater environment. A lot of these folks, they're field geologists, they go out into the field, whether it's Kelsey here or Trevor out into the field or Cindy Evans searching for meteorites in Antarctica and the other folks that we have along the bottom. Uh, I wanna give us an opportunity for you to actually meet some of these people and see where they're doing some of these uh, operations right there at the Aquarius topside facilities. So with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Dan Garrison and the science team there in Florida. Hey, everyone. Can you hear us? Hey, how are you? We're this good. Dan how Garrison. are you all? Yeah, we're in the science team trailer. We're here in uh, Isla Morta, uh, just down south from Key Largo. Uh, the Aquarius underwater habitat's about six miles offshore, but we're on shore in the facility that's hosted by Florida International University called the Aquarius Reef Base. Uh, the main mission control is inside a small building uh, behind us uh, where the, the CAPCOM and the uh, mission managers uh, work. Uh, this team, uh, the science team uh, led by uh, the group from Johnson Space Center, but also coordinating with area marine biologists uh, works out of this trailer, science team uh, trailer. And we coordinate uh, not only with the mission operations, and with the crew, but with the scientists, the marine scientists to conduct uh, coral reef studies. Uh, so at this time, I'd like you to meet uh, some of our uh, science team members. And we're gonna start off with our lead, Dr. Kelsey Young, who's right here in the front. And then we're gonna move down the line and let you meet each one of the science team members uh, in just a moment. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining us here in the Florida Keys at the Aquarius Reef Base. Uh, I'm Kelsey Young. I'm the NEMO 22 science team lead. And I'm working with um, all of our science team members here to accomplish some marine science objectives here in conjunction with the NEMO 22 crew. So some of the science objectives we're working on are we're building coral tree nurseries with the Coral Restoration Foundation and learning about what types of corals, what species of corals grow best at which depths to figure out how to repopulate reefs around the world. So we have a tight partnership with Coral Restoration Foundation for that. We're also working with marine biologists from Florida International University who are actually studying the coral reef around the Aquarius habitat. So the astronauts, the crew members in the NEMO habitat are conducting EVAs or simulated spacewalks, extravehicular activities to collect coral species so these marine biologists can study them and learn about the reef here in Florida. Um, we here in the ARIES group at the Johnson Space Center also want to learn about science operations. So how do you do science when we go to the moon, Mars, or asteroids in the future? So we're studying a lot of objectives like how to operate if you have delayed communications or even no communications. What products, what, what tools do you need to give your astronauts to collect samples and to work with instruments? And so we're learning all about how to do that in this analog environment, like Paige mentioned earlier. We want to get in this high fidelity environment with crew members and a mission control team and a science team to really understand how these technologies and processes work. So now I'm gonna turn you over to Dr. Cindy Evans, who's one of our science team members. Hi there, I'm Cindy Evans. And this is particularly exciting for me because it brings together lots of our scientists in ARIES to support exploration activities. Now, Kelsey was our science communicator today. Today, I played the role of being the liaison between the science communicator and the the, the CAPCOM, the person who talks to the astronauts. And, and it was what, what it was particularly exciting for me is that it brings together things that were really um, spearheaded during the Apollo period of time when, um, when there were the astronauts and the scientists who were devising exploration of the moon and the mission operations folks and the engineers all got together, they all trained together and then they did their operations together. And this is what we need to do for future exploration. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand it off to Liz Rampey today and happy. thanks Cindy. I am Liz Rampey and I'm a planetary scientist at uh, the NASA Johnson Space Center and during my day job I work on the Curiosity rover 
And so my role here at Nemo, I'm very interested in how we do science using robots, like, ro like the Curiosity rover, versus how we do science with humans on another planet. So how would we do science when humans go to Mars? Uh, what sort of science team members would we have? What sort of team uh, roles would we have? And how would that look different from uh, the roles that we staff on Curiosity? And so tomorrow, what we're gonna test is delayed communications as if we were on the surface of Mars. Uh, so it'll be 10 minutes delayed each way. So how does this 20 minute total delay in communications affect how we do science as a science team. Uh, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Kristen John. She's gonna tell you about her super exciting experiment that she's doing on Nemo. Awesome, hi everyone, I'm Kristen John and I'm an aerospace engineer in the Astro Materials Group at Johnson Space Center. Um, so I'm actually here working on a project that is DNA sequencing um, down in the Nemo habitat. So the crew members are actually taking swabs of samples inside the habitat. For instance, today Trevor uh, took samples from the shower. Um, and then they're taking, taking these um, swabs and, and running them through a whole process uh, that would normally take a microbiologist hours and hours to do in the lab. Um, but they're basically running through these samples um, and, and amplifying the DNA so that we can understand what it is that's inside the habitat. Um, so we actually get, you know, get an idea of the type of bacteria that we see down there. Um, they're also taking samples of their suits, of their, their wetsuits when they come in and out of an EVA. And one of the more interesting things is they're actually going to be um, sequencing coral samples. So this weekend they're actually taking samples of coral and then Trevor himself will actually be sequencing the coral samples. So this will be the first time ever that coral has been sequenced on the ocean floor. Um, so this has a lot of applications for monitoring the environment um, that you might see in Nemo for instance, but also on the space station or future spacecraft. Um, also monitoring the crew health. Um, and then there's some really interesting applications for astrobiology. So one day when we go to other destinations like Mars for instance, um, we need to be able to sequence uh, and sequence quickly to find out what it is that we're seeing at the environment. Um, so thank you guys for listening and back to Paige at Johnson Space Center. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, a little bit about all of you and your expertise. And these folks here, as you can see, they are part of the men and women uh, and lots of women are involved in Nemo. They, many of them have been involved in scouting Girl Scouts and or Boy Scouts for some of those guys that are out there. And so it is so exciting to think about what they're doing, its applications to the future of space exploration and how this is gonna help NASA move forward with taking one more step towards that journey to Mars and even other destinations. So thank you very much science team for sharing what you're doing. Keep up the great work. And we look forward to connecting with you guys, or I'll see you down there real soon. All right. Bye Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. And now, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to go to Trevor Graff, who, if he can share his camera, uh, Trevor is down there in the Aquarius Reef Base. And we're going to have Trevor. Uh, first of all, I would love for Trevor to introduce himself so that you all know where he's from, where he went to school, what kind of studies maybe he did, and what kind of work he does on a day-to-day -day basis, and then we'll actually start getting into Nemo. So, hello, Trevor, from 62 feet under the ocean surface. Take it away and tell us a little bit about yourself there, Trevor. Hi, everybody. Great to connect with you from uh, such a unique place down here, 60 feet under the ocean. Um, like Paige said, and like you've heard a little bit about uh, the NEMO operation, it's, it's a great analog, and we're really excited to be down here um, executing as we are. We're now on mission day five, and it's really been a great analog. Um, myself, my name's Trevor Graff. I'm the chief scientist with Jacob at the Astromaterials and uh, Exploration at Johnson Space Center. Um, and I went to school in Ohio. I got my undergraduate degree at Youngstown State University um, before going to work at Johnson Space Center. And then I went and got my master's degree at Arizona State University. Um, and now I work full time at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, I had many jobs uh, as project manager and got to do some cool things, driving the rovers on Mars or controlling an instrument on, on Mars. Uh, with a bunch of robotics that we've been involved with now for a decade on the surface of Mars. 
But one of the cool things we get to do at Johnson Space Center is work with the crew and train the crew and think about how we would do science operations on other planets. And so that's what we're doing down here at NEMO. Um, and so what I would like to do is introduce you to NEMO. I know you've heard a little bit about it, but I wanted to introduce you to the Aquarius Habitat where I'm now sitting. And one of the best things we like to do is look out the window because we're essentially sitting inside a aquarium and you can see out the window, you can see fish, you can see the reef structure, hopefully. And we just sit here at night and during the day when we have time, stare out the window, watch the fish go by and uh, really enjoy uh, the view out the window. It, it never gets old. So we have two viewports like this in the habitat. Um, there's this one here, which is the very front of the habitat, which also happens to be our bunk room. So if you guys are ready, I'm gonna take you through a tour of the Aquarius habitat, and maybe we'll meet some people along the way. And Trevor, one so quick question. From where I'm sitting? <laughs> one sure, quick go ahead, question Paige. That had come in from uh, one of the troops. Um, they were wondering, uh, first of all, were you ever a Boy Scout? And with ter in terms of the, the, and how has the Boy Scouts helped you with any of your career uh, uh, activities? And the other thing is, do you see anything other than fish? So two questions there for you. <laughs> sure thing. Yes, I was a Boy Scout. I became an Eagle Scout actually um, in, 1995, I believe, I was an Eagle Scout. And the unique thing is there's three Eagle Scouts down here right now. So three of the six crew members were Eagle Scouts. Um, and so it really is a unique way to learn the skills that you need to do things like this. Uh, just the other day, I was thinking back, I had to tie knots underwater um, in order to do some construction tasks. And that goes all the way back to um, being a scout and learning those things and so it, it really those skills you learn in scouting pay off dividends and we've been talking a lot of scouting stories down here um, with all the people and their experience um, through scouting so certainly great question and scouting is awesome and it really helped me get to where I am today. Any other questions Paige before we take the tour? Yeah the other thing was do you see anything other than just fish down there? Oh, sure, sure thing. Well, we get we got some topside divers that come diving down. Um, we have the, the coral that we're working on. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see the, the structure of the ocean floor as I tilt the camera down. So we work on the coral um, and we go out and do these EVAs that Paige was talking about, the extra vehicular activities, and go out and study the coral and understand how the changing environment is happening um, in this area and learn about the coral and we send that back to that awesome topside team that you heard from um, where they understand and, and, and help us select the coral and do measurements on the coral and then we even do in DNA sequencing on that coral um, so we do a lot on the coral reef and the structure on the ocean bottom um, and the fish are just amazing. You can see a lot of yellowtail snappers out there and during the evening, we get some huge grouper, about 150 pounds coming by, some big tarpon. It just never gets old. Awesome. Well, we'd love Any other to questions, get more. I think actually going on the tour and we'll see what other questions might come through during that. Sounds good. Okay. Like I was saying, I was sitting at the front window that's inside the bunk room. And so kind of like a submarine, there's six bunks, as you can see, that are stacked up. And this is called the bunk room. This is where we sleep at night, all six crew members pretty close to each other. Um, we have some storage area. I'll show you my bunk, a little messy, but I'll show you where our storage area is. And so that's where we stow all our gear. And that's it's kind of like camping. It's almost like a, a big camper trailer, um, living next to each other and uh, in close quarters with all our gear stowed very tightly and compactly. We'll go into the main gap. Ali now, hopefully you'll still be able to hear me. And you can see the crew working in here. So we've got Dominic and Chell, and Pedro's having a meal after a, a tough TVA today. He's sitting by the, the main galley window. And so here's another window that we get to look out at night. 
and during the day when we have opportunities and beautiful view and a great place to have a meal like Pedro is now. I'll show you all the, the controls and equipment to keep us alive down here that keep this, this, this great habitat up and running. Um, a lot of controls that our hab techs take care of and uh, really amazing how this whole thing works. I'll pan over to the, some workstations. And then one of the unique things we get to do down here is actually sequence DNA. Um, so we do experiments. My, 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 my major task today was doing a DNA sequencing. And you, I got to sit here all day, look out this window, another small little hatch window, and sequence DNA. And so here's my experiment in progress on one of the small work tests. So that's really fun, and I'm looking forward to sending those results to the science team here soon. I'll go ahead and show Dominic. He's making his meal now at the small kitchen. So Dominic's uh, preparing his lunch, and a uh, small little kitchen that has a sink and you know the equipment we need. One of the most important places is where we stow all our food. So it's right at eye level, so we're always snacking. And I'll show you just the types of food that we eat down here, almost like camping. And we have quite an assortment. So it's not too bad. And then I'm going to move into what we call the entry lock. So we're moving through the lock now. And you can see our workstation. So this is where we conduct the science operations. Um, so it's a very tight place with a lot of electronics. And on the other side, we have some more controls. We have the cameras that we take out on EVAs to show different um, views and capture those camera views. We have navigation equipment to tell us where we're at when we're out diving. So that's the map of the sea floor that we use whenever we're out diving. And then we have a unique opportunity happening right now. We have a diver that just came back up and he's going to get unhatted. So this is how we go EVA. And so this is Sean. Hi, uh, Sean. He just came back from a pretty long EVA. So he's going to get lunch here soon. This area inside the wet porch is how we go in and out of the habitat. So it's a, it's a wet porch where we just swim up inside the, that water there, step up like Sean is now, and take all our gear off. You can see it gets kind of tight in here with all our gear and all the equipment that supports our dive. I'm going to move back through the habitat here. So we're back in that entry lock. Moving through the main lock. And we'll go back in the bunk room and see if our commander, Joe Lindgren, can say a few good words for us. Hey, everybody. Oh, hey, everybody. We're uh, real excited to have you join us here um, in the Aquarius Habitat. Uh, this has been a fantastic experiment or experience. We're about halfway through this 10 day mission. Um, we've already accomplished a lot of science. And, uh, and had the opportunity to go out and, and do some uh, real science outside as well, studying the corals and uh, evaluating different uh, spacewalking strategies. So um, this is a, we have a terrific crew. feel very fortunate to be a part of this. Uh, we have the, the, the six folks that are down here in the Aquarius Habitat and then an amazing team both uh, on land that, uh, that is supporting us as well as teams um, from various uh, centers and universities all over the country. So um, this is truly a team effort, and it's a real honor to be a part of it. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And with that, Paige, I'm going to turn it back over to you and see if there's any questions that I can answer while I take another seat by this window and show everybody that's listening in the uh, marine life that's now looking in. Awesome, and thank you so much for the tour. Uh, we It actually did spark a couple of questions that came up, Trevor, and um, and we also appreciate you pointing out the different crew members as well as the Habtechs, because as we mentioned earlier, uh, and, uh, and for all of those that are on the line today, a team effort is so important for the success of so many activities, including this NEMO 22 expedition. So team members both on top and below the surface, uh, so, so very important. 
So Trevor, some of the questions that came in, one of the groups, Mount St. Mary's High School asked, you know, are the activities like using the bathroom and, the, and showering a lot different um, down there than they are on land? I mean, we didn't even see a bathroom or a shower. Do those even exist down there? Yeah, we kind of went quickly through the wet porch um, and standing behind where Sean was getting hatted inside that area is the shower and bathroom. So it's a really small little area, but it's uh, just like you would at home and, you know, shower in this, in that area. Um, and can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. I thought we dropped off. Um, yes, it's very similar. And uh, that's all done in the wet porch and uh, And is, is privacy something? Is there a door to close or a curtain? And do you shower every day? I mean, that might seem like a strange question, but is that how, you, how is it very similar to what you do if you were on the surface of the earth normally in your home? Yep, just like camping. Um, just like, uh, you know, as you'd go out camping, you might grab a, sh a quick shower um, someplace, like a, a small little restroom or something like that. So it's, it's very much like camping in an RV. Very interesting. Well, the rubber ducky patrol um, has was wondering um, what's what's the pressure down there, and where do you get your food from? How how did all that food get down there? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the the pressure is two and a half atmospheres, so it's it's a little it's a lot more than up at the surface. So we're actually in a saturation dive, and we'll actually have to do decompression on the way up. And all our food comes down by topside support. So a boat comes out, uh, puts all our food in these, in these chambers that keep it water sealed, and then they swim that down to us, come up through that wet porch that we saw, and they bring that into the hab, and we put it up on those shelves that you saw. And uh, that happens a few times during our mission. This is a 10-day mission. Um, and so we get a food run every once in a while to, to keep us supplied. Great question. So if your food runs out, someone can always bring down more. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Well, Stargate Academy, one of our other groups on the line, they're wondering with regards to food, do you eat space food like astronauts? So is there like freeze dried food or is it like normal food that you would have topside? We have a mixture. So we have food kind of like the astronauts eat um, the dehydrated food um, and so but then we also have chips and cookies and and soups and things like that uh, that's more considered normal um, so we have both that mixture our big meals are mostly that dehydrated food since it's easy and brings down and stores well very much like they have on the international space station so um, all that dehydrated food some of it's really good actually so i've been enjoying that awesome and related to food, Girl Scout Troop 7565 is wondering, what do you do with the wrappers from the food? Where, where does it go after you eat it? Where do you throw, at, throw it out or what, what happens with it? Well, all our garbage gets what they call potted back up. So we put all that stuff in reverse of how it comes down, put it back in the pots or put it in a mesh bag if it doesn't need to be kept dry and it goes back up to the boats and back to the shore. So it's a, it's a really intensive process, um, getting all the equipment down here that we need to do to pull off a mission like this. Um, and we're really appreciative of the guys that do that. And um, so we're gonna start returning some things here soon, back up to the surface as, we, as we're halfway through our mission. And then by the end, we'll have all, everything returned back to the surface and uh, we'll complete this mission here in the next uh, five days. Awesome. Uh, here's a, and you mentioned a little bit about um, uh, what you needed to do in order to recompress. And let's see if I can find that question that I saw come in. Um, so Knight High School is asking, how long do you have to decompress? How long do you have to decompress after each rotation to go back to the surface so you don't get the bends or you know have a problem when you're up back on surface? Can you explain that? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. And so on the second to last day before we, we come up, so on our mission day nine of 10 days, um, we'll start that decompression. And this is about 17 hours from when we start it um, until whenever we're able to come back up to the surface. Uh, luckily, most of that's during our sleep. And so it happens without us even knowing it. Uh, the Habtex um, that we have take care of that. And uh, so we basically just ride out that decompression time and wait wait for our time to get back up to the surface. And that so, question. yeah, and, and did you did you say you, you're, you're breathing different type of air during that decompression type of time? Yeah, for a small portion during the beginning, we breathe oxygen. Um, so that, but that's a small little portion and then we can sleep without those oxygen masks on. Excellent. And safety is a very important aspect of all of these expeditions and the Aquarius as a whole and the Florida International University do make sure that all crew members and all individuals that are down there do follow safety protocols so that everyone does stay safe. And that brings up a question from Mount St. Mary's High School. They're wondering, do you perform any type of emergency drills and what are those types of drills? Yeah, your earlier point page was great. And, you know, the safety is paramount down here and we go through all that training. We actually spent a week prior to coming down in training on, on you know, how to dive that hat that you saw Sean in um, and how the, all the emergency procedures. And so if there's, you know, an issue down here, we have plenty of life support that lasts us many days down here without any kind of topside support. Um, and so we're trained well and have all kinds of redundancies in place to be a safe mission down here. Um, and so it's really a safe operation and really done very well out here at Aquarius Habitat. That's what makes this so unique. Excellent. Well, you know, Scouts of Andrews is wondering, up at least on top side here, it gets dark these days around 7 p.m. or so. And Scouts of Andrews is wondering, does it, what time does it get dark down there? Does it get dark early or, you know, what's, what's that like? It's about the same time. Um, it starts maybe getting dark a little bit early because we lose the light through the, the water column a little bit earlier than uh, um, up on the surface. But then we have some cool lights that they turn on that are underneath the hab, and that really attracts some of the marine life to come see so we can see out, and it also attracts them so that they come feed at night. Um, so that's one of our favorite activities, is sitting by the, the viewport windows down here, looking out and uh, watching that all happen at night. Awesome. And, um, and let's see, I know a, a question here from Hampton High School. You talked about, um, and Kelsey and the science team group talked about uh, these coral trees and the coral health. And Hampton High School is wondering, what is the health of the coral reef surrounding Aquarius? Around Aquarius, there's some beautiful coral reefs and that's what we're studying. But it's also, you know, over the many decades in this area and others, you know, there's been some decline and, and scientists are trying to study that. Um, I'm trying to get a barracuda that's coming up this way. You may be able to see off to the right. Um, and so that's the type of thing we're studying here. And, and the research we're doing will, will fold into that, re that, that um, types of studies that people are really interested in and some of the diseases that may be happening to the coral reef and some of the changes that are impacting our world and, you know, this local environment. And I'm not no, sure if you can see it, but there's a giant, giant tarpon that's kind of in the background back there that's causing some of these smaller fish to scurry a little bit. Is he off to the left or to the right? Uh, he just swam from right to left but now he's uh, going around the, the backside of the habitat. Now, I know a couple of the groups have asked, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the different types of fish, are there other sharks or rays or other things that, uh, that come around as well? Yep, we've seen some big rays and some sharks. Uh, Pedro saw a nurse shark whenever he was out on the, on the EVA today, and uh, it swam by him. 
Um, but we see all kinds of things. One of the coolest things I've seen down here are the squid at night that uh, get lit up by those lights I was talking about. Um, and so seeing them move around at night is really cool. Um, but see all kinds of marine life. We also really enjoy the big grouper down here because he's kind of a character, looks in at us sleeping at night, and uh, he's really curious, almost like a, a big dog down here. Uh, that's funny. Now, with, with regards to the coral reef and the studies of the coral reef and the marine biology science that's going on, can you explain at all how does the marine science that you're doing down there as part of the Nemo expedition, how does that relate to the future of space exploration? Can you help us make that connection? Sure thing. And I, I think Kelsey touched on it a little bit. The types of things we're interested in um, at, within our Astro Materials group and here at JSC and things are the science operations. You know, how we conduct um, operations to collect science and do instrumentation and things like that on the surface of other planetary worlds like the Moon or Mars. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing here. We're collecting science, we're taking images, we're communicating our progress and our status out there when we go out on these EVAs. And so that's what matters is for us is all that operational piece. And then there's also the training for people and the team, um, how to, how to, you know, communicate and collaborate to, to pull something like this off. There's a lot of parallels um, to, to how we do space operations. Um, and so that's what we're learning here from a NASA's perspective. And it's, it's really one of the best simulations to do this. And are you also taking samples of corals? And is that also um, highly relatable to uh, the idea of collecting astro materials and contamination control? Has that been done either during this mission and or previous missions? Yeah, for the past two missions and this mission, as well, we are collecting samples of the coral and we're trying to keep them pristine to, until we get them back to the marine scientists who are doing actual DNA sampling on it and, and, and publishing papers on the results. So we're trying to get them the best samples when we're out there on EVA, um, make sure that they don't get contaminated by anything and uh, they get the great science that they're looking for. And when you collect samples, do you as a crew member make the decision on what samples to collect or do you look to get instruction from the top side folks that are helping you through your EVA activities? Uh, the top side team is key for those type of things. So the, the top side that you were introduced to, they tell us where to collect and how to collect. And, and so that, that's the, that's, that's that operations piece that I was talking about of how, how we communicate, you know, from that team with all their expertise. Um, and we're basically their hands out here on EVA and living in the app to go out and conduct the science that they want us to do. Um, but they've trained us well in case we lose, lose communication or have to make the calls ourselves. Um, they've trained us well so that we can, we can conduct some of that ourselves. Um, so it's a little bit of both, but we really, heavily rely on the top side team to uh, conduct those science operations. And this is really important for those of you that are on the line to think about if we send crew to other planetary worlds, them getting instruction from a remote team that's watching what's going on that has a variety of expertise to make sure the right samples are collected, that it's collected in a, in a way to be able to preserve how pristine those samples are. These are all things we may not think about, but they're so important to be able to get pristine samples and the right samples for further study if they're brought back up topside or brought, brought back up to Earth, uh, whatever the case may be. So these sampling things are extremely important. And as Trevor said, they really parallel um, what they're doing down there, what types of things will be looked at and addressed for future space exploration. Now, Trevor, Gulliver School actually has an interesting question for you. They're wondering, do you have assigned chores and who decides what responsibilities each of you have? Ah, great question. We have 
of a packed schedule of assigned chores. Um, from morning to night, we've got a list of things, our schedule um, that marches along and keeps us busy from start to finish of the day. Um, and that's all done by the Mission Control Center back on, in Florida. So they, they schedule that, they work with that science team that you met, and they make sure that everything is scheduled for us so that we can uh, execute in an efficient manner. And so we really appreciate their efforts up there um, scheduling and making sure that we stay on task and on track. And, uh, and I'm sure you really do re rely on, on all of that. And so you say you don't have very much free time. So one of the questions one group asked is, do you watch any TV while you're down there? I uh, have not had the opportunity to watch any TV, but the best TV, honestly, is what you're looking at now, and that's the window and watching these fish. It's, it's a, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to just stare out the window 60 feet under the water and watch all this marine life. And it changes throughout the day. It's, it's really interesting to watch how the marine life changes um, with the small fish coming out at certain times and the big fish coming out at other times um, and how they interact with the, you know, days where it's, it may be stormy up on the surface or calm. Um, it's really a unique ballet of fish down here and, and sequence throughout the day um, that you start to get used to as you spend a few days down here. Yeah, it looks like it would be real fun to, to watch. Now, WWP has a really interesting question that I wonder if others have had the same question. When you were showing us the wet porch, and the crew member coming out uh, of the wet porch. And so their question is, why isn't the water from the hatch and that open hatch at the wet porch, why isn't it not coming in to the hab? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's because the hab is pressurized. So the, 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 the atmosphere inside the hab is keeping that water out and that's why we're at pressure, and so our bodies are absorbing more nitrogen and other inert gases, uh, and so that's why we need that decompression is because of the pressure that both keeps the water out, but it also is the reason why we are considered saturation divers and need to do that decompression we talked about earlier. And what's interesting is Trevor and the crew members down there that have been underwater for over 24 hours have now joined an elite group of what we can call aquanauts. So um, aquanauts, there, I don't know how many there are in the world, but they just added four new aquanauts to that, including Trevor and the other crew members. So that's pretty fun. Now, Home School has asked, uh, um, related to Nemo and the missions, at the end of this mission, will you be replaced by a new crew? And how often do these Nemo missions occur? <laughs> Uh, great question. These Nemo missions uh, happen about every year or so we do one of these for anywhere for 10 days to two weeks. And there's also other missions that happen down here. And so those happen, you know, throughout the year, the Navy and other academic institutions use Aquarius for, for marine research or other operational things. And so NASA is just one of the, the people that come to Aquarius. There's many others. And would you like to be another crew member on another mission if that ever came up as an opportunity? Absolutely. This is a really cool place to be, and uh, I don't think it would ever get old. And now the, the I think it might be the same homeschool group is asking um, if uh, if how does a scientist apply for a place on a NEMO mission? Is it very selective or how, how does that work? How, do, how does one get selected as a crew member? Well, first you have to be a diver or a scuba diver. So um, getting qualified early when you can, if that's an interest of yours, um, I would definitely encourage you to get scuba qualified and dive um, um, in, your local area or go on vacation and take scuba dives. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, having an interest in marine science or that science operations, uh, that, like geology of planetary surfaces, all that combined um, makes you a good candidate for one of these NEMO missions. And so 
that's kind of what led me to become a crew member is, you know, my passion is scuba diving, but I'm also very interested in those science operations um, that, that astronauts do on planetary surfaces in the, in, on, like on the moon or Mars here in the near future. Um, so those two things made me a good candidate to be part of this NEMO mission, and I'm really happy to, you know, have this opportunity. It seems awfully exciting, and these fish are absolutely amazing, which brings us to a, a couple of questions from uh, our groups. Rubber Ducky Patrol is wondering, uh, let's see, uh, they, they are wondering if you're in the deepest part of the sea um, or if, if it drops down even further. Uh, great question. Um, it does get deeper and we're allowed to go out diving. Like, you know, Sean, when we had it up in, in that in that commercial diving helmet, we were able to go down almost to 100 feet. And so we're at, at you know, 60 in the sand here, um, but we can go down another 40 feet deeper and do work down there, which is really unique because scuba divers can't spend much time at depths like that. And so, but we can spend up to four or five hours down there working. And so that's really the advantage of doing this um, is to have that, that time whenever we go out on EVA to, to do the work um, at depths. And that's also of interest to the marine scientists or those, those deep nurseries and deep coral that we're working on during this mission. So. Great question from that school and uh, well now here's a, a question an interesting question from logos prep academy have you ever seen and, I, and you mentioned you've seen some sharks but have you ever seen a shark eat a fish while you've been down there I haven't seen a shark eat a fish, but last night was the first time we saw a grouper, a grouper that, that giant 150 pound grouper that I was talking about eat a fish. So that was pretty cool. So did he just open his mouth and, 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 and eat it? Or how, how, was, how did that poor fish get to be victim of the grouper? <laughs> he kind of like created a, a suction and, and just sucked him right up and it was a big uh, thud in the, in the habitat and that was that grouper sucking in a fish. Um, he moves really slow until he goes to make that final grab of the fish. Well, it's too bad you didn't get that on the camera because that would have been quite interesting to see, that's for sure. Here is a question from Clark Planetarium. They are wondering if there are any citizen science projects that tie into the research or would be good parallels to either the NEMO mission itself or any of the coral research that's going on. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the unique things we get to do is partner with the Coral Restoration Foundation here. And so we, we're doing some work on some nurseries that they've built here around um, the Aquarius habitat. And so I would encourage you to go to the Coral Restoration Foundation. Um, I know they have a webpage or a nonprofit organization that does some great work and uh, have opportunities for students and for volunteers to help them out um, in the great work that they're doing, both here in the Florida Keys, but also internationally. So no matter where you're at, um, you can get involved with them and help out. Yeah, and, I, and the, the, you know, our oceans and the corals are such an important part of uh, our earth and their ecosystem and our whole ecosystem. So uh, protecting our oceans and the work that they do. And we'll, we'll make sure to send out a, uh, an email link to the Coral Restoration Foundation so that some of you can maybe take a look at uh, some of the work that they have going on uh, around the world. Um, now, Tempe High School has asked an interesting question, and I, um, I know I would like to know, uh, as well as some of the folks on the line, is there a program for teachers to apply for any kind of short mission in the summertime there? Are you aware of anything like that? Uh, I'm not aware of anything like that, but I would definitely encourage people to go to the Aquarius uh, Reef Base. Uh, web page and check and see if there's opportunities there and while you're there you can also click on the link of watch live and you can watch us work down here for the next few days and so 
that web page will, uh, will tell you what opportunities that are here at Aquarius, um, provide the contacts, and but while you're there, you might as well click on the video link and you can uh, watch us work live here um, for the next four days while we're down here in Aquarius. And we'll definitely make sure we provide that link. Actually, we were sneaking a, pink, a peek before uh, the webinar started to see some of the things going on uh, both in the HAB as well as outside the HAB. And so we'll definitely make sure to share that link with our participants. Now, Homeschool has a really great question here on uh, when you do work to collect samples and such on your EBAs, do you work entirely independently in a, on your EBAs or are there any kind of ROVs or robotic operated vehicles that help you do some of your work? Uh, so we go out in pairs when we do EBAs and then there's one crew member that stays back in the habitat and kind of controls and kind of tells them what they, where they should go and how they're doing on their timeline. So they're kind of the quarterback of uh, things back here in the habitat and can communicate to those two EBA members. Um, later in the mission here in the next few days, we are probably gonna incorporate some robotics. And so we've got some robotic assets that may bring us tools and uh, be assistance to us while we're out on EBA. So that's gonna be really cool to see here. And hopefully if people are watching using the live, uh, the watch live, uh, uh, webcams, they can see some of that actually taking place. Now, Trevor, I know we only have a few minutes left, and I know there might be some questions that we didn't quite get to, but there are two or three questions that I want to make sure we get in before we bring things to a close, since I know uh, you're getting ready to go off and do another duty here in a few minutes. But one of the questions, and we'd love to see you in the window, can you tell us what is the value of NEMO 22 towards future space exploration missions in, in sort of, in, in your own words, how is this valuable for the future of space exploration? Can you, can you share a little bit of insight into that? Yeah, NEMO is really unique, like I've been saying, in order to, to make that connection. So it's, it's, it's helpful to, on the tools that we take out on EVA, um, so all those tools that we need for science are really good um, parallels to what we may do on space exploration. Um, the techniques, those science operations that the science team we're talking about and I've also touched on. Um, the technologies, there's a lot of cool technology that we've had down here. Um, one of the things we've been using is a HoloLens, um, so virtual reality goggles. Um, so that types of technologies we're learning a lot about uh, how to use. Um, and how it would be best in science operations and for future space exploration. And then finally is the training. So the types of training that we do in order to come down here and the team and the, the, the personnel, all those four things, the tools, the techniques, the technology and training really provide us the, uh, a great analog and NEMO, NEMO brings all those things together. And so it's really fun to be a part. It's been a privilege to be down here on, as a crew member. And uh, I greatly appreciate everybody's interest in dialing in and making sure you know, they're, they're aware and their interest in, in NEMO and what we're doing down here. So I wanted to thank everybody um, from the top side and everybody that dialed in. Um, their participation and their interest is greatly appreciated. And we so appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your very busy day to be able to join us here today. And uh, um, one last question, if I could sneak one in. Do you have any recommendations for the teachers and or the students and scout members that are on the line? What do they need to do to, to, to any recommendations you have for them in school or studies or jobs? What, what kind of parting words can you give to them? Uh, my biggest recommendation is follow your heart and your dreams. Um, if anything I talked about today was interest to you, then you're definitely, this is a type of path for you to, to study science or engineering or technology. Um, and so if those types of things interest you, those are the types of things you, you, you should pursue. Um, so if any of this was cool to you, you know, definitely 
follow up and you know get scuba certified or go study science to be able to do geology or marine science or whatever interests you follow your heart and you can't go wrong great well we appreciate it trevor and i know your time is brief here so you've got to depart uh, so on behalf of all of us here at the johnson space center and the webinar as a whole thank you so much for connecting with us for those of you on the webinar line, I'm going to do some additional closing remarks, but we're going to depart from Trevor here. So uh, thank you again, Trevor, for joining with us. We appreciate it. Great. It's been my pleasure, and I'll give you one last look out the window as, you, uh, as I say goodbye. And there are those fish. Boy, wouldn't you like to be able to be in that location and in Trevor's seat right now, but who knows, maybe one of you out there, and I see a barracuda, maybe one of you out there someday will follow in these footsteps of these crew members like Trevor and all the others. So thank you again, Trevor, when you must uh, depart, which I know is, is soon, thank you again for sharing your fish, your Nemo 22 experience, and your life there in the underwater habitat. Hi, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks, Trevor. And so, folks, I have to say that um, what a special opportunity to be able to connect with Trevor. Uh, as you can see, uh, the life down there is, is quite uh, interesting. I know that we didn't get some of your, um, uh, your questions answered that down uh, with Trevor. But I will say that um, uh, NEMO every year, NEMO continues. So let's say NEMO were to occur next year, that mission would be NEMO 23 and then NEMO 24. So each NEMO mission, and you can see I have the NEMO patch on my shirt. This patch was actually designed by Trevor himself. And it's somewhat of a tribute to uh, some of the historical missions that have taken place underwater with missions such as Sea Lab, um, but uh, so this uh, this particular logo designed again by Trevor kind of sort of plays tribute to some of the undersea exploration from the past, and the up arrow on that sort of brings it up to space exploration and the exploration on into uh, future future missions that may occur. So in a couple of uh, minutes, we'll kind of totally bring this to a close. In terms of the patch, I don't think that it's orderable. I, I will check into that. And if I find out that the, the patch is available somewhere, I will certainly let all of you know. Um, so because it is qu quite an interesting patch, and you might have seen even on some of their shirts, they had other um, uh, uh, patches on as well that are part of the NEMO missions um, too. Um, so with that, again, if we didn't answer all of your questions, I really did my best to try to get them all out there and answer it and pose to Trevor. But um, I will also, and let's see if I can do this right now. I'm going to put in the in the chat window a link where you can actually, let's see, you'll be able to follow the mission live and let's see i'm gonna do that's to a particular camera but the watch live link that i put in there you can watch them they're actually doing another connection event uh with the whole crew and another group they don't get as much time as we do we got a full hour of nemo today which i feel very lucky to have been able to share with all of you but anytime you want to watch in on them live, I'll send a follow-up email to the lead educators that were on this session today. And I think with that, since we are 20 minutes past the hour, I'll first say thanks to all of you for taking time out of your summer to join us today. The Girl Scout groups, the Boy Scout groups, the planetarium groups, the museum groups, the solar system ambassadors, the educators, we're going to have an archive hopefully available so that you can share with other students, other teachers, other people that may be interested in viewing this. So we'll get that out to you as soon as we can. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. A special thanks to the NEMO 22 team, including top side and the bottom side crew and all the support people that make these NEMO expeditions such a successful way to help NASA and other space agencies prepare 
for future space exploration missions. So with that, we hope you've learned a lot. Thank you again for joining us today from all across our nation. Um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. We'll send you an archive soon. And thank you for joining us today. With that, we'll bring it to a close. Thank you, Emily and Rosina for facilitating as well and making sure uh, we could help everyone out so they can participate today. Thanks everyone, we'll see you soon. Take care, have a great summer, and we'll talk again soon.